All right, guys, it is time for our, uh, you know, three, four times a year check-in. The last time that uh, that Peter and I had this conversation, it was about our New Year's resolution. So that is where we are going to begin. And, uh, of course, we have to address address the allegations leveled at, uh, at, at my well-known mentor who doesn't know I exist, Andrew Huberman, the, the article uh, in the New York Magazine just came out, and I, I definitely want to talk about that. Um, Pete, man, how's it going? How's life? How are you? Are you enjoying um, not being stuck to the big board right now? Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, I don't know. If we were going to actually pace this podcast before we got super self-indulgent, we would talk about the Huberman stuff before we do all the navel gazing. So I'm down to do that. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah, let's do it. So for those of you who don't know, it's, it's actually really not um, that intense. Basically, uh, the host of the, the second most popular or second most listened to podcast in the world, Andrew Huberman was just the subject of, you know, I'm not going to call it a hit piece, but definitely uh, an article in the New York Magazine that does not paint him in a very favorable light. The the TLDR is that this man was uh, simultaneously having multiple very serious relationships with up to six women. Um, really, really just, uh, yeah. Uh, Andrew, Me- Andrew Huberman's Mechanisms of Control, the private and public seductions of the world's biggest world's biggest pop neuroscientist. So Peter, the question is, why should anyone care about this? And I think the reason why this article is so big and why it is, I mean, it was like basically the most read thing on the internet um, this week. And I think the reason why is there's definitely this sense in the self-help space and particularly with the good doctor that there's something a bit off about being so obsessed with self-knowledge and self-improvement so i think that that one just sort of fed into what people had already believed which is that there was something off and then the other i actually think it is a bit of schadenfreude right where people are like no one is actually this perfect no one actually does these optimization things and and is always working on themselves and always lifting weights and and yada yada so i think there's a, a big part of that too of of people who don't like what Huberman stands for and we're looking for a reason to begin to discredit the whole thing. Yeah. And obviously this hit piece centers around uh, a bunch of relationships. He was juggling and essentially playing a lot of women, but I had already started to feel the groundswell of people wanting to tear him down. I don't know if you had seen a bunch of the tweets. I feel like in the world of academia, there were people who were starting to push back that his science was you know, a little loose. He was being a little casual, the things he would, Big time. you know, you know, he would say things with such definitive thing and like point to a study. And then these people would be like, well, that study actually wasn't uh, as conclusive as you're making it out to be. So I think, you know, once you get that big, people are going to start coming for you, but it is the fact that he became a mainstream podcast but on the back of science. And I don't think we've seen something like that before. We've seen Tim Ferriss, who's more just like, I'm going to experiment on myself and tell you what I do. Whereas he was like, no, this is actual fact. And then he kind of started to blur the lines of that as he pushed into the upper echelons of podcasting. Now, my my own opinion would be, specifically with, with the thing that people bristle at the most, in my experience with Huberman, you have to be really online to bristle at like uh, like the athletic green sponsorship like the athletic greens like for people who don't know it's primary sponsor of his podcast it, it's basically you know nothing it, it, it's not even a viable supplement and it's very expensive but the the thing that people who are only casually acquainted with with his stuff bristle at the most is his very clear deterrence for alcohol he basically says like no alcohol alcohol is poison you know, four or five drinks a week, you think it's nothing. It actually is something. And that that's the thing I see mocked most on online. And I, I, the sense I get is that really people don't like being told that something that makes them feel good is, is bad for them. That that is that just in general, people really bristle at that. People don't like their comfort mechanisms being attacked, whether it be sugar, whether it be alcohol, whether it be television, gambling, whatever, you know, I, I mean, those, those things, um, you know, they're all, they're all dopamine things and, and Huberman, and he's not the only one, right? People hate, um, Brian Johnson, right? The, the millionaire who all he does is try and optimize his life. People, people state like there's something deeply unsettling about trying to optimize every part of your life. And like, maybe I agree with that. Maybe I don't, I, I would need more time to think about it, but it does feel, 
I don't know. It, it, to me, I, I'm having a hard time with it because obviously Andrew Huberman, not a perfect person. Um, not maybe not even maybe not even a role model, right? But definitely someone who like has p- definitely positively positively impacted me, like no question about it. Yeah, and I mean, people, this kind of stuff happens a lot, right? It happens with artists. There's still people who love Woody Allen films while being able to maintain that he's probably a very, very shitty person. Um, you know, so like that stuff can exist. I think the thing with Huberman, it's not the fact that he was juggling a lot of ladies, right? Like if this was Jeff Nippert or some fitness influencer who did that, everyone would be like, all right, yeah, yeah you're whatever. in really good shape. Yeah. You're famous. It's the fact that he is trying to tell this story of entire lot life optimization. And one of the things I know you've read the Peter Atia book, like a lot of the like newer, like science things about health and wellness is about this like whole well-rounded thing where it's like this stuff bleeds into your relationships. And I think Huberman, it's the hypocrisies that's getting him here because he hasn't just stayed in a lane of like, hey, this is the appropriate sun exposure you should get. Right. He's had relationship experts on. He's had mental health experts on. He's basically sold this thing of like, I'm going to lay out a blueprint for how to live a GTO lifestyle. And this obviously pokes a big hole in that bigger infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, one of the things in in talking with people about it, like in Discord and stuff is like, oh, like, you know, what should I care? What I, I don't care if um, Tyreek Hill has nine women hanging out at his house or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I don't care if Tyreek Hill has nine women at his house because Tyreek Hill doesn't interface with my life in a way to tell me based on the belief and research I've done, this is a way to exist that'll make you happier. And if you do what I say, you'll feel better you know it's like i think the nippert example actually probably is a good one where yeah if this if if the new york magazine decided to publish a piece about jeff nippert it it would go down no one would know right it just no one no one would care because jeff nippert doesn't have uh dr paul conti come on his podcast and talk about developing happiness in in relationships and the other thing that I found so distasteful about it, and there's been other examples of this, the the one that was coming to my mind was the um the Jonah Hill one. Remember where Jonah Hill had the the deal where his girlfriend was a surfer and he was like, Hey, you know, he used all this therapy speak to basically be yeah. like, you know, this is this is hurting my boundaries. And all the text messages that Huberman's ex-girlfriend who communicated with this writer for the New York magazine, it was all therapy speak. You know, it was all like this space has been very difficult for me. I'm hoping that we're able to work through this landscape. Like it's all, and I, I, I've come to find that sort of therapy speaks super distasteful, particularly when it's done as a way to maybe not excuse, but definitely um, explain bad behavior. Yeah. And I think the thing for, for the people who say like, who cares uh, what I will grant them is like, It is kind of sad that this is the state of journalism now, that New York Magazine, they know that this piece is going to absolutely crush. Like gossip fodder in the pot. It's the same thing like the what would be the uh, the holy grail would be like a Mr. Beast getting canceled like that article like gossip for our new age celebrities. Uh, But it's wild to think that like New York Magazine is devoting resources to like frisking a Huberman ex-girlfriend group chat or whatever in the same way. Yeah. The, the bar stool, uh, they've tried to do lots of uh, Portnoy takedowns, like women, you know, from his past. And it's like, this is what gets people to click. Like, this is the first time I've opened up New York Mag in a long time. And in to forever. me, that's kind of like the sad part. Whereas like 10 or 15 years ago, granted, where we wouldn't have been where we are with the internet now, like this piece would not have gotten made. It would have been on Reddit. It would have been whispered about in circles and everyone would have moved on. Well, it's, the, it's also like the, the changing nature of, celebrity too you know like let's see how many how many instagram followers do we think andrew huberman has i i have it pulled up i'm gonna guess 15.5 million wow that seems a little high to me i'd say five it, million yeah it, it is high 6.1 million followers so not yeah. not you know i mean let's see here how many does uh how many does joe rogan have joe rogan instagram because that because i guess rogan is probably the most popular podcaster in the world the I would thing say is, neither Huberman or Rogan are like native to Instagram. Like it's the podcast yes. download number that would blow your mind, you know, for these guys. 
Yes. So, I, and there was Spotify published their thing at year end, and Rogan was number one, and Huberman was number two. Which I guess one just tells me um, men are more interested in podcasts than women. I mean, that would be that would be. Also, imagine being um, like a married woman who is a fan of Huberman's podcast and just being like, "This is how." Like it, it's it's one thing as a as a man because you know, word like the 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 male is the one doing the betraying. But clearly like what it I guess maybe the most upsetting thing about it is that it, it it's clear in Huberman's interfacing with all these women that he didn't take any of them all that seriously. Or or that yeah. he that he was he was being totally unwilling to like truly share his internal life, I guess. Yeah, and I don't want to diminish the experience of the women and feeling like they were just pawns in his game because that very clearly happened. But it's almost just more sad that this guy who set out to optimize everything and essentially search for the perfect life, you know, clearly has not found it and has so much turmoil right. finding these escapes and these distractions and love however he can find it. And it's like this guy who done the research and now tells us how to live our lives optimally is not happy. You know, that's, what's kind of crazy yeah. and sad. And, and it does go to show that with this optimization stuff, like just because you do everything like literally by the book doesn't mean you're going to be happy. Well, and, and that so that was another thing from the piece um, was that it mentions that he's just kind of a flake in terms of communicating. Like there were multiple references to meetings set up with not not like dates, but like meetings set up or like he's going to go um, hike with this journalist or go. What was it like windsurfing in Hawaii or something? And he he invites this guy out to go windsurf with him and then cancels the or it was diving. It was diving. And they're going to do this diving trip. And then Huberman cancels the day before after this guy had like gotten diving certified or whatever, which, yeah, I mean, it does. It, it definitely, to me, it painted a picture a little bit of a guy a little bit trapped by their own success and just being like not ready to handle it. You know, like I, I think uh, in another point, the article made that I thought was so that is very poignant is that without COVID and that isolation period, the Huberman phenomenon probably never happens like the 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 author makes i think the very cogent point that his show came out at a time when people were feeling like a real lack of control and and just like so locked onto their their phones really it it honestly blows my mind that his podcast got as big as it is not saying because he wasn't like giving good information but just the way it's presented it is presented in a very academic way like i find right. the podcast to be extremely dense um, it is stuff that I would rather read than listen to in in that way. Like I'd rather read like a, a long paper about his podcast episodes than listen to him deliver it. And the fact that it became the second most popular podcast compared to something like Rogan, which is essentially like throwing on talk radio as you're right. driving around in your car. That's as easy of a listen, comfort food listening as you're going to get. Like this requires legit active listening. Like I've tried to listen while multitasking or like can't really. working out. No, you'll miss so much. And so the fact that he was even able to hold people's attention spans to that extent blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, even still knowing how successful it is and seeing, and we've talked about this, but like the clear hunger for all of this stuff for you know, Peter Atiyah's stuff for, uh, you know, and, and there are um, uh, clearly like the Huberman, Peter Atiyah, Brian Johnson stuff is more geared towards men, which is not to say that women don't find it useful, but there, there are like female equivalents of, of these guys as well. Yeah. There, there's a clear hunger for it, regardless of, al almost regardless of age, of gender. I mean, we've all seen those studies that come out about Young people are young people are drinking less. Young people are are going out less. Young people are doing all of these things less. And I I don't think it's I don't think it's as simple as saying like oh you know it's more expensive to do all those things. I do well and obviously like the you know our our friend Brian's favorite topic the the male loneliness academic uh, epidemic. I I think that stuff totally plays into it as well. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Brian Johnson because uh, he's obviously a weirdo for people who don't know. He's this tech mogul who made like hundreds of millions of dollars and now is on this like uh, lifespan optimization hunt. And he's using himself as this test subject to basically try to optimize everything for longevity. And he's like built a company around it and this protocol, yada, yada. And he's a he's a legit wackadoodle like you know, injects himself with weird things. So he gets like a extra centimeter in his erection, all of that. But putting that all aside, 
when I listen to him talk, he's doing it all from a self-experimentation. He's saying, this is what works for me. This is what our testing is showing. And yeah. I kind of, I appreciate that approach more. He's just like, I'm going to do this on me. I'm going to present this, do with it what you will. It worked for me. Whereas the Huberman stuff, when you come with the force of academia behind you, it just feels like this is the way and everything you do other than this is wrong. And I think that's what put him as such a prime target for a takedown. Yeah, it's not, the podcast is not colloquial at all. Like if all you did, you, you didn't follow him on Instagram, you didn't follow him on Twitter, you didn't listen to other podcasts, you, you, you didn't get on Reddit or any of these things, how much, just from listening to the show, how much would you know about the guy? I mean, I don't think you'd know if he was, you knew he, you, you would know about Costello, the bulldog. I mean, that's yeah. really about it. You, you would, I guess he's mentioned things about his childhood. He's mentioned, you know, that he skateboarded growing up. He's mentioned that his, his parents divorce and things, but I, I don't recall. It's not to say I've listened to every minute of every episode. In fact, I, as the episodes got more esoteric and less about, um, like, like the emotional health and, and things like, it's like not that interesting to me because, yeah, I, I have more experience with that. Like that, that I actually don't feel the need to turn to an expert about. It was more like the weightlifting and the like, just you know how to get bigger, faster, stronger, whatever. That I didn't know anything about. Yeah, you you wouldn't know anything about him, I don't think, or at least have a very small picture just from listening to the show, which is so weird because podcast is such a parasocial medium. You know, where yeah. I, I if I'm listening to a podcast, I want to know what I want to know about your life. Yeah, and that's what what makes it interesting, and I think it made people particularly fascinated about him and why there's such an appetite for this piece, even aside from the scandalous stuff. Like, if New York Mag just said, we followed around Andrew Huberman for a week and wrote about his actual life, here's what he actually does uh, during the week. Like, people would consume that article. I mean, I, I would probably have yeah. read that faster. I probably would have, I'd, yeah. like, I, I would have clicked that article. Because at first, I was like, do I even want to read this? Do I, yeah. th this person who clearly has influence me in a positive way do i even do i even want to know and to be honest my feelings about the show not really changed like i i'm not gonna i'm not gonna unsubscribe from it or anything like that maybe i i yeah i just i think i think all it really does to me is paint the picture of a guy who just doesn't have it all figured out and really wants to and i think the other thing that kind of dovetails with his fame and you just mentioned it like a lot of his podcast episodes now are in the larger orbit from what he started yes. with. And it's like, put yourself in his shoes. This guy is making boatloads of cash on every episode. I mean, unfathomable amounts of money, podcasting, all of his sponsorships, the downloads, yada, yada. So if you have a tightly focused podcast, there's only so many ways. If you're not going to document your life, that you can say the same things over and over again. So you have to vent out into different topics. Let's have a relationship expert on. Let's have someone who talks about like how to keep your erection. And he's just like, let me try to, you know, make content because every time I do it, it's so lucrative. And I think that also put him as a target because he started venturing out beyond the things that were actually his specific domain of expertise. And I mean, it requires it, right? The guy has to do 52 podcasts a year. And there are only so many ways you can say, yeah, go get go get some sunlight in your eyes, resistance train five times a week. Only so many times Andy Galpin can come on and be like, all right, yeah, you got to do 150 minutes of, of zone two cardio per week. Um, so that's like that's just kind of that's like a business decision in, in you know, kind of the nitty gritty of of content, which is that to be one thing, you have to continue to either innovating on that theme, I imagine would be very hard, right? Of like, how am I going to innovate this theme of science related? Uh, really? I mean, the idea is for it to be a neuroscience podcast because that's his specialty and that feels kind of limited. And imagine like his, okay, you, you, you and I are our style of podcasting. We just turn on the mics and go, right. imagine how exhausting it would be to have to plot out his kind of things where he's essentially in tandem reading, uh, you know, uh, a bibliography, you know, citing every single thing he says, like those things have to be behemoths to put together. And then on top of it, you're still trying to make it vaguely interesting things that people want to optimize for. Um, I, I do wonder how much he truly enjoys that process. I'm sure he enjoys seeing the clicks and the downloads come in, but it doesn't seem that fun to me, especially once you're outside of the topics that you actually are passionate about. I mean, I think 
my sense is that when he says like i love science i love learning my sense yeah. is that that is true my sense yeah. is that that is something that that gets him up in the morning that maybe would not get me up in the morning of like reading all these research papers now as you become more famous and more rich i mean think about what the average associate professor at stanford makes i mean certainly it's a good living but it's not yeah. second biggest podcast in the world living right yeah and that uh, I mean, look, it's it's the it's the disease of more that like sports teams talk about. But like, I bet when Huberman wakes up on in March of 2024, his fire to go and learn more about ophthalmology has got to be less than it was four years ago. Yeah, and I think it kind of goes back to the thing too of like you know deifying these types of people where it's like I don't know the way I approach it. It's like, I like cherry picking stuff. I like listening to these guys. I'm like, oh, that actually seems like an interesting thing. I want to try that. Or like, oh yeah, that actually sounds logical. Let me see how that works for me. And you just kind of stay aware of things and you let, you know, the science point you in directions and then you experiment and feels like what works for you. But like basing your entire identity around being a Huberman bro, other than being like, oh yeah, he's had a few podcasts that have like really helped me build some good habits. Like that makes sense to me. But being like, I worship at the altar of, of Huberman is, is a weird thing to me. The thing, the thing that took me from a, a worship level was, uh, weirdly enough, not any of this, but when he had Mark Zuckerberg on, which I think was over a year ago now, I was just like, I can't really imagine anyone who is further away from helping us optimize our lives and our um, happiness and our neurochemistry than Mark Zuckerberg. And that, that to me felt like a clear delineation of this podcast existed for one reason before and now this podcast exists as a podcast that is designed to grow. Like everything yeah. going forward on this podcast is about, it's about growth. It's about marketing and it just feels less organic, which is not as fun, which, you know, happens. It's, it's, it's the, you know, I saw this band, um, you know, I, I saw this band at a, at a college bar five years ago and now they're selling out MSG or whatever. Yeah. And I don't even think it has to be like that you know, Huberman's a sellout, but you can just say like the content is different. He like talks about different things than I initially, uh, cared about. Um, cause I, even, I was never a Huberman maxi. I was always a cherry picker. Like I would see his podcast come in my feed. And if the topic looked interesting, I would, uh, listen to it. Like the, uh, the episode about the alcohol. Uh, I listened to that one cause I was curious what he had to say about that. Um, but yeah, I, I it just like his episodes aren't enjoyable for me. Like I'm never like, holy cow, I can't wait to devour this two hour and 45 minute Huberman podcast. It always felt like a chore to me. So I definitely, I don't know what this, it says about me, but I don't just the, the brain health and the, um, you know, the, the relationship health, like all that stuff. I, I just, I never end up listening to them, but then I'm going through and just looking at the ones that I've listened to and all the ones that I listen to are like, well, I listen to the Goggins one and then it's like, don't eat, it, you know, don't eat sugar, don't eat processed food and like new weightlifting protocol. And, uh, Dr. Galpin's on about, you know, how to, how to properly strength train. So it's pretty clear just from looking at these, like what I'm into on his show versus what I'm not into and probably there's a much bigger market for that given the aforementioned therapy speak like therapy itself is like it's kind of like a gen z thing maybe where it's just like that it's such a huge part of our culture i i have you watched love is blind yeah so like the whole show now all the characters are just using therapy speak all the time it's all like you know you helped me find a space to, to blah 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 which is like whatever good for you but it's not really the way people talk and it just, I don't know. It's I, and I feel like, I feel like there's such an overlapping of, of those things. There's clearly an appetite for it, uh, which, and I'm not, um, a sociologist, so I'm not going to speculate at the reasons why, why that is. Yeah. Now it'll, it'll be interesting to see where he goes from here and also what strategy he takes. You know, we've seen a lot of these things. Break I have concerns. Just... I have concerns about the strategy he's going to take. Cause I'm pretty sure I know what he's going to do. I mean, the, the truly optimal thing is to act like it never happened and just keep, I'm just oh, yes. putting myself in his shoes, just completely ignore it, keep producing podcasts and let it wash away. Um, but sometimes the hubris uh, kicks in and you feel like you need to set the record straight. So what I fear he's going to do is go full kind of conservative um, firebrand style guy of being, you know, like I, I hope that's not the way but like 
you know, there's this thing that's pretty interesting, which is he like never talks about politics, right? Uh, and you know, he's been on Rogan, who people dislike for like ideological reasons, and like Lex Fridman and all that stuff. Um, but there's this thing that he doesn't address, which is like your show got popular during COVID. You're a neuroscientist. You do all you you've done shows about the common cold, about the flu. I well, one I know he's never done an episode about COVID. And I, he's definitely not mentioned the vaccine, pro, con, should you take it, should you not take it, any of these things, because he knows. Republicans buy tennis shoes, too. <laughs> well, I, I think I think he, he knows Republicans buy tennis shoes, too, but I think he also knows it's more the other way. It's more Republicans are already buying his tennis shoes. I think it's more Democrats buy tennis shoes, yeah, too, exactly. um, for, for him. And I, I wonder if this would be an, an inciting point for him to go that way and just be like, yeah, this is, this is who, this is who I am now. I, 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 I don't get the, I, I guess what I should say is that would be, that would be my fear is that he just becomes, you know, neuroscientist Ben Shapiro or, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's probably within the range of outcomes. It seems unlikely. It doesn't even seem like he has that ability as like a broadcaster and a conversationalist to like have yeah. those talks. I mean, everything he does is so heavily scripted and prepared. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see him at the top of a show be like, give like five minutes, like addressing these comments or whatever, and just move on. I mean, um, uh, yeah. And for whatever it's worth, I mean, if I was him, I, I probably wouldn't say anything either. And and also I do want to make another fair point, which is like, this pretty clearly is judging him by like the worst thing he's done. That's like provable to some degree, you know, yeah. because these, these clearly this, the author of this article, um, you know, contacted his parents, contacted his family, contacted his, the place where he works, contacted all of his ex partners you know, was clear and a clear attempt at, at dirt digging. Right. And I'm not going to, I'm oh, definitely yeah. not going to go down the road of like, this is bad journalism or whatever. Cause it's actually the opposite. It's very good journalism in the sense of like getting your sources it slanted one way. Sure. Um, but it, it is good journalism. You know, does anyone deserve to be like surely judged by their worst moments, the worst shit they've done? I, I don't, I don't think that that's like a hundred percent fair for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll be, it'll be interesting to see the fallout. I haven't seen much, uh, other chatter. I need to go back and like read some of the replies on the New York magazine tweet. Uh, I'm sure there's some good stuff in there. Yeah. Uh, it, it'll be, I mean, I think he, he might do some reaching out to his buddy, Joe. I, I think we might see a, a Joe Rogan appearance maybe where he, where he talks about it, but like, you know, we've already had, we've already had some other stuff come out like, like Lane Norton, tweeted and was like you know I, i'm not going to stand by not going to stand by what he did but those are his personal relationships that's very different than what andrew does professionally and there will be other people who say stuff like that too which is honestly fair I, I think you know like should should andrew huberman be canceled for mistakes he made in his personal life? i think it would be very different if the piece came out and said Andrew Huberman is making up studies or, 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 you know, what, or we, we went to go uh, to his lab and it didn't exist, which is, which is something they tried to say, but it's clearly not true. It clearly does still have a lab at, at Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like so much of this stuff, I think the reaction and fallout is going to be polarized. Like Huberman super fans and people who love his podcast are going to be like, whatever, I don't really care. I come for the information. I don't care what he does in his personal life. Right. And the people who are like, this guy got too big for his britches. Um, his science is a little weak, blah, blah, blah. They're going to be all very excited about it down with Huberman. Ultimately, I don't think much changes. Like I don't get the vibe. People are mass unsubscribing from his podcast because of this piece. No, no, I, I don't, I don't get it either. It's honestly, like in the end, it'll probably be sound and fury signifying nothing. Like how many, like, you know, Brad, Brad Pitt's not canceled for, or it's Leo Nardo DiCaprio that only dates women under 25 or is it Pitt? Yeah. It's, it's Leo. Um, yeah. Like he doesn't get canceled for that. Like, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's all of us just kind of um, distracting ourselves until, until we die, which is probably what you're doing listening to this podcast or watching this on, on Pete's YouTube. So wow. it's really the same thing. And, and I thought we were going to do about, 10 minutes on here we did a full 30 now now we can be self-indulgent now we can be self-indulgent so the last time peter and i did the show we were talking about our our new year's resolutions um mine were mostly centered around tracking my eating for all of january which i did uh improving my flexibility mobility cardiovascular which i have mostly done 
and uh, benching 225, which I have not done yet. Where I've, I'm up to 205 without having to ask for a spot. So we are we are in we are in the vicinity, but we are not to 225 yet. Nice. Um, yeah, that's uh, you gotta you gotta get the uh, the Dylan Lub. You got what? What did he throw up? Like 26 at 225? Something absurd. Mal- uh, Malachi Corley. Malachi Corley did 20. Four, I think at like a hundred and at like, at like something crazy, which is uh good for yeah. him. Good for him. Good for our boy. Um, so yeah, I I'll, I'll pull up Cause we had done that show, um, right at the end of the year. And then I wrote about it in the PO box newsletter, my weekly free newsletter. And I had talked about my main goal being, uh, to read more. And I think one of the things that was fun about our conversation, it wasn't just goals. It was what are the systems we're going to put in place what are the routines we're going to set? What is the framework to actually achieve these? Not just being like, I'm going to bench 250 by the end of the year. It was like, no, I'm going to bench X amount of times this week. I'm going to do this and blah, blah, blah. And you know, my big thing for reading more was that I was going to do no more phone in the bedroom. And as of, uh, it was mid-January, I have not taken my phone into the bedroom. Uh, I'm now six books deep uh, into the year. And one of the things that's been fun to kind of see unfold is all of the other positive downstream effects from that, where it's like, okay, not only have I been reading my Kindle at night instead of my phone, but now I'm hooked on these books. And so I'm reading my Kindle during the middle of the day more when I have a little bit of time. So I'm just naturally reading more. Oh, because I'm not on my phone scrolling and staying up later. Now I'm getting more sleep. Okay, now I'm getting better sleep. Now I feel more energized. So I'm getting better workouts. I'm feeling more energized. And I've just noticed this snowball effect with all of that stuff. And uh, and that's been, you know, super fun for me to see like one little shift of not bringing the phone and how like the positive dominoes can can kind of go in effect for you. It is. And it's generally speaking, my experience has been that those things are, um, the, the changes are pretty small to make. They suck. Obviously, like it it sucks to not scroll Instagram for 30 minutes before bed because it just feels good. It's just scratching. Um, you know, that that uh, dope to, to get my Huberman on that that dopaminergic uh I- immediate response. Now, I, I actually have um like what's I don't know the right way to so like I, I throw a real roadblock for for myself which is that um i am not living in my house right now i'm living at really? i'm living yeah i'm at, I'm at my in-laws i'm uh, so you, you can see from my background here not my not I my didn't normal notice background that you've been broadcasting from different spots i was curious what was up with that so so my father-in-law and i are remodeling two bathrooms in my house um we're doing it you know just just us no plumbers where i'm you know i'm, I'm cutting tile I'm, I'm learning a lot from my father-in-law who is really good with this stuff I, i'm not all that handy super blessed position to be able to stay in my in-laws house it's like we have a whole level of the house to ourselves the dogs here like it's it is all very chill you know like this is not like i'm not living on the side of the road or in a hotel room or whatever but i am a pete i am a, such a creature of habit and immediately getting knocked out of that very difficult right so it's like you know i don't have my i don't have my you know, I don't have my fridge space. I don't have like the things that I always eat for lunch, you know, all that. You're just, you're kind of on someone else's schedule. You're kind of on your own schedule and you don't, you don't necessarily know what every day is going to bring. And, um, something that we definitely talked about on the new year's Eve show. And that I feel now is that I, uh, I do a very, very poor job maintaining discipline when my environment changes. So I did the, I did the, um, the calorie counting and everything in January, very good sense of like what I'm eating, what I can eat healthily of what, cause I mean, have you ever, have you ever counted calories? Like done, done it on an app? No. Well, what you, what you realize is that a lot of the times your meals are probably pretty fine. You know, it's yeah. like, Oh, I'm going to have, I'm going to have some eggs. I'm going to have some potatoes. I'm going to have uh, chicken and rice, uh, whatever. And they're all pretty well within the range, but then you start to add up. Okay. I had dessert on Tuesday. Um, I got a, a croissant with my coffee on Thursday. Oh, this coffee that I normally drink with whole milk and caramel syrup that I thought was like no big deal is like actually 350 calories. And those things kind of tend to add up. And then when you get off the counting, maybe for a week or two, maybe for a month, 
you can kind of be like in your head, you can kind of keep tracking like, okay, I'm at 1500. I'm at 1600. I'm at 2200 and 2200 is maybe fine for what I'm going for. But what I, I'm now just at a stage where I've just kind of given myself the grace to use, to use some therapy speak to just not be super disciplined. And that goes so poorly for me, you know, because Mm. then I, you, are you a big all or nothing guy? Do you fall into the all or nothing trap? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I want to keep hearing about yours because kind of what you're going through right now in the all or nothing is kind of my relationship with alcohol right now, because, um, I've really been changing some of my behavior with that. And I traditionally was an all or nothing guy. And I've really been trying to practice moderation. And it's been hard for me because I do fall into that, uh, normally all or nothing. Like I'm not drinking at all, or I'm like binging over the course of a weekend with buddies, that kind of stuff. Right. So, so, I mean, that's just my personality for everything. I mean, just in in everything, it was my, it was my issue with drugs and alcohol. It's my issue with video games. It's my issue with Instagram. Like right now I deleted Instagram and Reddit off my phone. Just, just deleted it. Cause I was like, dude, you are just, I mean, it, it sounds so insane, but it's, it's more productive for me to even draft a big board team than it is for me to, to look at Reddit or whatever for, for half an hour. Like it, it just is. And So the trap that I, and this is obviously not the first time this has happened to me, but like traveling or, or off your schedule. So it's like, whatever, I'm just gonna, I'm going to eat some Oreos. I'm going to, I'm going to have what I'm like, you know, I'm probably, I probably have had so many 2,500, 3000 calorie days, which is like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not going to get morbidly obese, but it's, it's definitely moving against the goals that I had for myself at, at the beginning of the year. And it's such a, I, I have found no escape yet in my life for the psychological trap of the, of the all or nothing of just, you know, everything in moderation. I, I really can't do it. Well, and man, I, the living, if I were living at my in-laws, the, it would be very, very hard for me to maintain so many things that I do, because like you said, it might not sound like a lot to people like, Oh, having your refrigerator space, but like that stuff like matters because that are, those are the things that help you stay in line, whether it's even organizing things in your head. And also you don't want to be a burden on them. You don't want to make their lives difficult being like, actually, yeah, you made a really nice dinner, but I actually can't have the risotto because that's going to put me over my calorie count. Everyone who has ever, Everyone who has ever done a diet or calorie counting and has been in a group situation like that has felt the experience of being like, oh, I don't want dessert, right? You ever, you ever told someone you don't want dessert and they're like, the fuck you mean you don't want dessert? Like you people get like offended by it, you know, not not even offended, but it's just, it's, it's for whatever reason, sociologically, it's a little bit uncomfortable, right? Or, or, or drinking beer, right? Everyone, oh, you want another drink? No, I don't want another drink. Why don't you want another drink? everyone is that's that is a universal experience for everybody for sure and that's why i traditionally have my most success like building habits like during this off season like during february march and april because it is when my environment is most controlled i'm not traveling i'm at home there's not a lot of events not a lot of holidays in that span there's just not a lot of ways that things can go wrong and so then when i can continually control my environment like i set myself up for success whereas like oh yeah then you go on a trip you're not exercising you're eating whatever you want you're drinking whatever it's so much harder to carry those systems over um but yeah like I've always been the all or nothing where it's like, I'll just eat and drink whatever I want on a weekend. And then it's like, okay, I'll fast for a couple of days. I'll like dial in and then just do those spurts. And my big thing this year and recently has been to also just practice moderation, like taking the binging aspect out of it. And I think I've had, since we probably talked last, um, uh, or not since we talked last, but over the two past two months, I think I've had seven or eight total drinks. So maybe like averaging one drink a week, like a single drink, um, a week over that span. And that has been, I've learned so much about my psychology and my relationship to alcohol and what made me crave it. Um, and I'm feeling like I'm at a, such a better spot with it. Cause I realized my association with alcohol wasn't even like I needed a buzz or whatever. It was, I associated it with a celebratory thing, either meeting right. up with friends, the end of the week, you know, something good happened, uh, at Lauren's job and we're celebrating whatever it was. And I, I started to realize it's like, 
I can celebrate in other ways, but I had a Pavlovian response to it's time to relax. It's time to celebrate. Alcohol is part of that. And I've been having to like pull that association away and it's been hard, but I'm, I feel so much better getting to that spot. I mean, that is, that's a spot. A lot of people can't get to it's, it's definitely. Um, so like for me, the, I, so I've been able to, to, consistently still exercise like I think I, I think I actually am so addicted to exercise now that it would be harder for me to just give up and not go than it is actually for me to go like I it's yeah. just like if, if there's a day I don't go it it like actually like mentally like ruins my day I, I'm just like disorganized I can't think I just I feel bad if I don't if I don't exercise in the morning so like which for a lot of people is actually the hurdle I I've obviously I've done you know countless um you know, reading of, of Reddit threads and self-help books and all this stuff that, that actually the harder thing for a lot of people is getting to the point of not actively hating exercise, which is not something that you or I really have had to deal with, which I, I suppose is nice. But the, I, I, you know, ultimately what I think it is, is I, I very similarly to you, I view food as a reward, like a total reward mechanism. Like you, you had a good day, you, you lifted a bunch of weight, you ran five miles, yeah, eat, eat, eat whatever you want, order, order a pizza, get, get Chinese food, whatever. And the, I, I still wish I was one of these people that just was a food, a food is fuel person. That would just, I can't even imagine how happy that would make me. Yeah. Well, it's it. We all have our, our things that, you know, are our version of that. I mean, I don't know if this is similar to you for eating, probably not, but the thing that's been nice about the alcohol and scaling it back is it dovetails with the reading before bed and getting totally. better sleep. Cause you, I mean, I know you don't drink anymore, but like it, drinking messes up your sleep. Like you do yes. not sleep near as good. And I have, you know, I get up earlier with April. I'm way more clear headed. You're not dealing with the fogginess, hangovers, anything like that. And that has been massive. And so to be like, not only am I getting more sleep by going to bed earlier, but I'm getting better sleep. And then I look forward to that. Like I, I keep thinking of it as like, I want to give like my future self a gift. Like, yes, I would love to have a couple cocktails right now, but the Peter in 12 hours will be so, so grateful that he didn't. And I've been like enjoying that gift to myself uh, in a way that's made it a lot less easier to not drink on a specific night. Um, I mean, have you, so, so you're, uh, you're a little older than me and you're also a dad. Have you, have you had the conscient conscious thoughts of like, this is not only is this going to help me 12 hours from now, but the more that I delay gratification and the more that I do these things now, the more I'm going to be able to move my body and, and be like a real person when I'm 65, when I'm 70 versus someone who's going to be bedridden or, you know, has to live in a single level house or, or whatever. You know, it's funny. I don't think for a while, I don't think I ever thought about that explicitly, but it had to have been within my subconscious. I think there's a fear of like, that's why a lot of my exercise until recently has been just like pure maintenance mode, just always do something, stay active. Because I've always said like, the older you get, the harder it is going to be to establish a new baseline. And to whereas yeah. like now, like I, I started doing a, like a resistance training program and more of the progressive overload stuff in these past few months, it was easy for me to snap into that because I already had my like good baseline. I wasn't like optimizing or whatever, but like I was in shape and I could just roll into that. Whereas I knew if I had like 20 pounds to lose or like whatever it was, like say I had a bad back, it would be so hard for me to get to the point where I could do that. And so I think deep down, I'm always like, I just want to maintain, 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 because I know it will be so hard to get back to this each progressive year of my life. Yeah. I mean, so once you're over 40, you lose about 1% of your muscle mass per year and you, you can really stave it off via resistance training. Like you, you can, you can almost neutralize it for a while via resistance training. But yeah, I mean, and every, um, so it's like every pound heavier you are, it's an extra four pounds of, of pressure on your knee. So think about it. Um, you know, if you're, if you're 200 pounds, multiply that by four, 800 yeah. pounds of pressure on, on your knees like that, that is, you know, that's a, that's, and that's going to make running harder. Like it's going to make, uh, like that's actually something I've noticed is I, I've been running a lot and I had not been running a lot at all. In fact, I probably didn't run once in 2023 if i had to guess probably probably went on no runs and i started ramping up really hard in january i ran 
a half marathon or ran 13, 13 miles. Wow. And, and I actually got up the next day and like I was sore and I was fine, but then I kept running that week. And by the end of the week after my hamstring was just like shot, like I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. So I had to take like two weeks off from, from running after that. And I was like, that would not, would not have happened to me when I was 25 that, or, or it wouldn't have happened to me if I was in better shape beforehand. Yeah. It's, it's funny. You mentioned the thing about cardio because, because I'm doing this strength training program, I have way less time for cardio because I just have a yeah. set amount of time during the day and I'm doing a five day a week program with a couple of off days. And I've been doing some light cardio on my off days, but I'm not running near as much as I was when I was basically lifting only a couple times a week and had more of a balanced program. But the other day, you'll like this. I went and I have this, I've talked about it before. I have this hill by my house where I like to go run these 200 meter sprints. And I hadn't done that in like probably five or six weeks. It's been a while. Um, and I went and it was this weird thing because my cardio was bad. Like I was out of shape cardio wise, but my legs were so much stronger, stronger having done it, that it almost completely mitigated it. Like I felt stronger going up the hill running. I was just completely gassed when I got to the top, my cardio, I was sucking wind, but my legs were just infinitely stronger than they had been. And I had never really kind of done like heavy weight training while doing cardio at the same time. And it was cool to see the progress you can make even aside from just not doing cardio. It definitely, I mean, look, if you, if you are a runner or, or anything like resistance training is going to help that, but I, I, I will add a word of caution, which is that if you, I mean, all I've done for two years is bodybuilding exercises, like not, not flexibility, not yoga, not even really stretching that good. And what, so I went skiing um, a month ago. I went skiing with my brother-in-law uh, in, in Oregon. And I, Peter, I was so sore after the first mm. day of skiing yeah. that like the next day was like actively not fun for me. Like I was so beat. It was, it was in my, it was in my calves and my hips. They just got so tight from basically, I mean, really more or less just like, I I'm just a ball of very tight, you know, muscles up and down like my spine and my legs from just doing these like really heavy lifting exercises, but not, you know, I mean, the, this is not the same thing, but like Goggins talks about this in his book where like all he did was run and run and run. And then like one day he woke up and he like basically couldn't get out of bed. He was just, yeah. he was like too tight and like had to take like six months off of running and basically just like unpretzel his body. Um, you know, all of this does sound very overwhelming. Like when you start talking about these things from a holistic approach and I don't want it to sound that way to people you know, like, yeah, the, obviously you will have roadblocks, but at the end of the day, um, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Like just getting up and moving your body, doing whatever it is you can do, lifting weights, walking, running, hiking, skiing, yoga, whatever. Like it is, it's going to be better than doing nothing. And you're, you're going to have your own individual challenges along the way. Like Peter's challenges are going to be different than mine. Like there's just the way it is. And, and that's why, I, to me, and I think we talked about this last time, and I've, I've, I like tossing around the phrase optimize for momentum. Um, and I think it applies to so many things because it's so easy to get caught up wanting to have things perfect. I want my full program in place. I want to know exactly what I'm doing every day. Once that's all set, then I will be able to follow that program. But as you just said, like things derail us, that program gets thrown out. But if you can be directional in that thing, whether it's working out for me, it's like, okay, you know what? I had two drinks uh, a couple weeks ago. That doesn't mean I'm going to fall off the wagon. It's like, no, I'm going to then fall back into it. And I'm going to optimize for that momentum of getting back on track with that. And then what I think is fun is once you build up that momentum, then you can start optimizing. Then you can be like, Hey, I got this habit. I show up every day, but now instead of just going through the motions, all right, now I'm going to have a program. Now I'm going to do this thing. And that's what's kind of been my hack is like, I just show up, show up, show up. And then eventually I get so bored that I'm like, all right, I'm going to do a real program now. And now I'm going to optimize because I've already done the hard part, which is showing up, building it into my schedule, into my habit. But I think people want to optimize first and then try to build habits. And that's really hard to do. That is, I mean, that is such a good point, which is that you, you can care about the specifics later when you kind of know what you're doing. Um, like for, for weightlifting, that can be one thing for running. It can be another, I mean, the, actually this is the, the most helpful advice I got for 
running was don't focus on the speed you're going. Don't focus on um, don't focus on on the distance. Set yourself a time to run where you you just have to keep running. You just are you're not walking. You're you can go you could go walking speed, but still be doing the physical action of moving your shoulders and your arms and your feet in a running way. And that is going to help you build up endurance more than like killing yourself to be like, I got to run three miles. Right. And so you're running and then you're walking and you're running and you're walking. Um, it, it's actually like, I mean, obviously I don't know if it'll work for everyone, but it worked for me. Just be like, okay, you're going to run for 10 minutes and it doesn't matter if you only get 0.6 miles, 0.7 miles, whatever. Okay. You're going to run for 15 minutes. Okay. You're going to run for 20 minutes. And that just from, from a ground up, um, works that way. But yeah, the, the, the idea is, you know, do, do the simple things first, because if you start, uh, you know, if you start with the hardest thing, you're just not going to start. Right. I mean, that's, that's, (laughs) it's so funny, you know, ultimately all of the self-help advice in the world, every self-help book, every neuroscientist book, all, you know, whatever, it all ultimately comes down to none of it matters unless you actually do it. And so you got to do, this is the thing you always say, which is that the thing that matters the most is like what you'll actually do. Right. And that's like, you know, some people will be like with the book club, it's like, I hate reading or whatever. And it's like, well, find the, what are, what are the books you want to read? Is it, is it a book version of a movie you've already seen and that's going to make it easy? Do you want to go reread Harry Potter? Go Like go for it. Like if that is going to get you to build up that habit to not, open your phone and you want to do that or same with exercise. It's like, if someone's just like, I love the treadmill, man, I just fucking love walking on the treadmill. It's like, okay, probably not the best way long-term to like get into shape. But if that's what gets you moving, like go do the fucking treadmill. Like, and then when you get bored in the, you know, you're so blue in the face from doing the treadmill, then you're like, all right, maybe I throw it on the incline. Maybe I start running. Maybe I hit the pay, whatever it is. Like you will arrive there, but I've never want to shame people for, just doing the thing that gets them to show up and start doing something. You know, I, I, uh, I actually do that with reading. Sometimes I don't feel like reading like super literary fic. In fact, a lot of the times I don't feel like reading super literary fiction or, uh, you know, like I, I do try and read a lot of philosophy just cause I want to have read a lot of the great stuff before I die or whatever. But sometimes I don't want to read Socrates or Frederick Nietzsche or, or, you know, whomever, so I read a lot of science fiction. Almost, almost what I do is I will read for every you know very serious book I read. I'll read a science fiction book that's like, you know, I mean, you could you could burn through Dune, which it looks like a huge book. It's like eight hundred pages or something. I mean, you could burn through Dune in a weekend because it's just it's just, it's quick. You're just gonna get through it. Like it's fascinating. You you want to turn the page. It just well, I mean, maybe not if you don't like science fiction. Like if if whatever, maybe you're not a science fiction person. But everyone has their thing that's just kind of like light, be like more or less beach reads. I mean, honestly, like science fiction for me is like what like romance, like airport novels are to to other yeah. people. Like I can just I can just pick it up. I basically know every beat that's gonna be in the story. All the characters are more or less the same. It's always you know just kind of the way it is. Like I'm reading through the foundation books right now. And I've read like oh, five nice. of them in like the last like three weeks. Cause they're just, it's just easy to read, you know? And I, I, I'm not even in a great space right now, but, but, but the reading habit is so important to me. Cause it does, cause the same thing for you, it just how it helps me sleep. It helps me set up. It helps me feel like I did something productive, even if it is just reading shitty sci-fi and like everyone can kind of find a hack like that. Yeah. And it's, uh, and I've, I found too, like, I love some of the stuff too, um, where it's, it's stacking, it's stacking the stuff. Like how I've said, like, you know, I, I like doing workout. And then when I'm in the sauna, that's my reward for working out. And then I do meditation in the sauna. So I'm like triangulating three things, or it's like, I love like taking April out on walks and she loves getting outside, looking at everything. So not only does she get that benefit, but I get to get a a walk and get outside. And so I, I love those things where you're able to get, you know, multiple things going. It actually, I've said this on a couple of my shows, but another one of my habits that's been really helpful um, is I'm only drafting either on stream or doing a cardio club. 
Uh, yeah. No, no drafting. Otherwise I literally, I have, I did one of the, the biggest sports slow drafts. I'm in one of that. Cause I'm going to write about it. So I, I'm writing that up to uh, getting content, but otherwise I'm either exercising or on stream. And that has been huge for protecting all of my other time to do the things I need to do. I mean, that's, uh, Obviously, you and I are at different stages of our life. I have lots of sixty-minute windows throughout my <laughs> life where I can where I can do a draft. Like things are things are not the same, but that is um, for me. Like right now, like I have um, I have more time just because it's not during football season and I don't have a child, so I, I can I can just draft. But once the season really gets going and my content responsibilities are are a lot higher, and I'm just uh, am on like actually on TV more and more hours of the day. It's, it's not, it's not the same. Um, so I, I do that. I more or less have that rule. Um, once, once the summer starts where I either have to be walking the dog on the treadmill on the Stairmaster or, or on a stream for, for drafting. And, and I do, I mean, I abuse the slows. I, I am, I, I will be, I will be a frequent slow drafter, um, this you- summer. Do you know what I did for, because I was like, all right, I'm going to do this one slow draft, the hundred dollar one. Um, and I set up, and I've said this to people before and they always laugh at me, but I set up the, the notifications, the three email notifications throughout the day to make sure that I don't ever miss a pick because I don't have notifications on my phone. Like I will not get a notification because I have basically everything except text messages turned off for notifications. So I don't want to auto draft, uh, in this thing. So then I have my three checkpoints throughout the day of like, okay, I'll go in see if I'm on the clock, um, right before I leave my phone at my desk and go up for bed, see if I'm on the clock, if I need to star anyone. And that's also been like my way of being like, I'm not always having to just pull up the app and see if I'm on the clock. Cause I know with how long the clocks are that I can just schedule it and make sure I never miss a pick. No, that is a, uh, that is, uh, I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to make those steps. What you just said sounds much more mentally healthy than what, what I do. But so like I have notifications on for texts. I have, um, notifications turned on for underdog for DraftKings, And I think that's it, but like, yes, oh, and, F- and FFPC. Oh, for, for on the clock notifications or, um, I have it turned on for like, I reserve contests. So like I'll reserve when I go to the gym in the morning, I reserve like soccer, baseball, basketball, golf, whatever. And sometimes I'll forget about it in the middle of the day. And it warns, if you reserve, it'll warn you an hour before lock. Gotcha. Yeah. The, the problem is, uh, is all of these apps it's, you know, you can't segment out uh, the notifications of like, I just want on the clock notifications, you get promo notifications. And that's where it's a, it's a slippery slope. Um, but to like kind of land the plane here, what are you said? Like, when are you getting back into your house? Like, what are you going to do to get back to the place you want to get, or how long are you going to be in this spot? I think I, we should be, we should be about done. We just finished, uh, all the tile yesterday so we need uh we gotta we gotta install all the um like the the faucets and the the fixtures and everything and we need to finish installing the shower which should be pretty easy in in the downstairs basements so we're we're about done there um you know in terms of like overall stuff overall one through 100 like life health things i feel pretty good but yeah, I, I, I think probably what I'll do is I'll do at least a week, probably two weeks of calorie counting just mm-hmm. to um get get right back. I did I did do a three day water fast like two weeks ago How'd just to go? kind of honestly, actually, after the first day, pretty easy when when you once you wake up on that second day and you haven't eaten in like 36 hours or whatever and you're like, this is just my life now. It's actually like yeah. I mean, it's I don't want to say I don't want to say easy, but it does it does just become you know, part, part of you. Yeah. I've never done, I think the longest I've done is like 48 hours. I I don't, I I have a lot of practice with the intermittent fasting. The thing that's hard for me when you go much past that is like, I can't, I'm not exercising at all when I'm fasting. And then I'm like, I think, Oh, I, I did, I did exercise and I had like no gas. I like, I I had you had to feel so lightheaded. So like, like day three, you know, I wake up, I, I take my, I did, I did take pre-workout 
So I, I took pre-workout and creatine on a totally empty stomach, you know, go to the gym six in the morning. And I'm like, dude, I can't move shit. I, I can't, I can't, I, I, I was at like 50% like strength capacity. It, it was brutal. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I don't think, I don't think Huberman would recommend uh, exercising at the tail end of a, a three day fast. Yeah, no, I don't. Uh, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and guess that that is, that that is not um, GTO. Yeah. And then, uh, and then the benching 225, I mean, the, the deal is, is I am definitely strong enough to do it, but my form is just terrible. So I, I need to, I, I just, and I've worked on it a little bit. There's actually this, um, this bodybuilding dude who goes to my gym, who is like super cool and knowledgeable and helpful. And he worked with me on it one day a little bit. Um, and also it's like a, a psychological limiter, which is, yeah. that I, I, I'm just like scared to do it. Um, so I, I will, I will, con- and I, I do bench heavy twice a week. So it, it might just get to a point to where I'm strong enough to do it even without proper form. But, uh, that, that continues to be basically like, basically that's my white whale. Like benching 225 is my white whale. Yeah. It's yeah. I mean, it, it should be, it should be us tall guys. We got, we have longer ways to go to get our, our full range of motion. You short Kings even have it easier on that bench. So you should, yes. uh, you should get there. See, I'm, I'm like the inverse as you, the, the bench is probably my best lift. Um, and I've been building up my squat cause I have not done squat regularly for a long, long time. And so now I've been doing that program for the past couple months. And so I'm, I probably have a very weak squat, uh, comparatively, but trying to build it up. Well, I actually, um, so also I, that's another thing I've been doing is I am not barbell squatting right now. Everything I'm doing for legs is unilateral, um, in in an effort to improve like flexibility, mobility. And I'm also, um, I'm right side dominant where my, my right arm and my right leg are much stronger. So just kind of everything I'm doing right now, um, really other than deadlifting is, is all one side at a time. Um, in order to try and, uh, shift out those muscle imbalances. Yeah. It's, it's funny too. Cause I'm like following, I'm doing a, a nippered, uh, hypertrophy program, but I still am making very good. Yeah, it is very good, but I still like, I make some of my modifications cause I want like, like today, for instance, I had a leg day and I did some mods where I was doing broad jumps and box jumps. Cause like, I like having some of those like explosive movements, um, as opposed to just doing like the strictly lift stuff. So I'm, I'm kind of remixing some of the stuff, but it has been very fun to have like a a strict program I'm following and and doing the progressive overload and seeing like the tangible improvement. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I love that for you. Um, we, we will be doing a, uh, a book club episode with, uh, with our guy, Patrick Laird here pretty soon. Um, what, uh, what me, books are we reading again? I've not, yeah. I've not purchased them yet. Let me pull those up here. Yeah. As Davis mentioned, I've been doing the book club through my newsletter and I asked Davis and, um, Laird to help curate here for this next month. So yeah, I'm excited about these books. We got the trading game, uh, a confession by Gary Stevenson, uh, the little log line here, a vivid blistering memoir that takes readers inside the high stakes drama and hubris of the trading floor, a rags to riches tale of Citibank's one time most profitable trader and why he gave it all up liars poker for a new generation. I think anyone listening to this podcast will probably be, uh, into that subject matter. And then Laird, uh, was excited about this mystery novel. I guess it's the second, um, not quite a sequel, but from the author of everyone in my family has killed someone. It's everyone on this train is a suspect, a fiendishly fun locked room train murder mystery that offers a tip of the hat to the great Agatha Christie novel while at the same time being a modern reinvention of it. So it should be an easy read there. I do. I, man, that's, I, I love science fiction novels and I love a good mystery novel too. I love Agatha Christie and, uh, uh, Raymond Carver. Those are, or, uh, Raymond Carver, or Raymond Chandler. They're, I, I forget. Chandler, right? Yeah. Raymond Chandler. Uh, okay. Raymond, Raymond Chandler. I I've read, I've read, uh, he wrote eight, uh, books about, uh, uh, shit. I'm, I'm really losing my mind now. This one that Hugh, uh, Marlowe, Philip Marlowe is, is the name of his detective. And those are, those are some of my favorite books ever. So I'm excited to read this one. Have you, you said you've been on a sci-fi kick. Have you read the Blake Crouch stuff? 
No, that that's uh, a three body I, problem, right? Or no? No, no, no. He did uh, Dark Matter, which I had read, and then we read uh, Recursion this month. I just finished it up. It's it's awesome. Uh, you would like okay. it if you're on a sci-fi kick. Yeah, I am. I I read so I read all prompted by Dune two. I read all six of the Dune books, and then I read. I did. I ate my vegetables and ate uh, and read a, a Frederick Nietzsche book, and then I. <laughs> um logged back out and i was like okay i need i need the science and foundation is like so easy foundation like i read the first one of the day it's like 210 pages um so there is the, is the, is the really show hooked. version of that good i've heard people talking about that one on now brian's brian said it sucked but brian also is a critic of everything and i don't think you can take it i do not think you can take brian hooper at his word on uh, or i don't think you can take brian at face value on on science fiction okay uh all right land land, land the plane here for us davis all right, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for listening to Peter and I um, be self-indulgent and, and our conversation of, uh, of the good doctor, Andrew Huberman. I, I hope that you all found that enjoyable and interesting. I've got, a, I think, a pretty cool idea for a show next week with uh, Arif Hassan. We'll, we'll see if uh, that ends up. We'll see if that we'll see if it ends up coming out uh, the way that I think it will. But uh, that is our plan for next week. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. We'll get out of here. Later, dudes.